All right, so today I'll be talking about algorithmic foundations for the diffraction limit, and this is joint work with Ankur Moitra. Now, as the title suggests, this is an interdisciplinary work that broadly fits into the agenda of theoretical computer science as a lens on the natural sciences. And more specifically, the main takeaway from today's talk will be that insights from unsupervised learning, specifically mixture model learning and sparse recovery, can shed new light on fundamental problems in optics. So let me first give a roadmap for the rest of the talk. Um, I'll begin by giving some scientific background as some physical motivation for the model that I'll consider. Uh, and along the way, we'll, we'll see some of the historical debates surrounding uh, the so-called diffraction limit. Um, I'll give our results, and uh, for the rest of the talk, I'll give some brief tastes of the techniques that go into our algorithmic guarantees, and I'll conclude with open questions. Okay, so uh, specifically this talk will be concerned with the following problem in optics, namely, what are the fundamental limits, if any, imposed by the phenomenon of diffraction on the resolution capabilities of optical systems? All right, so what do I mean by all that? Well, let's imagine you shine a telescope into the night sky, and you might see something like this. So each of these five pictures is an image of a binary star uh, imaged by a relatively powerful telescope in uh, fairly ideal atmospheric conditions. And the salient common feature among all five images is this characteristic ring pattern surrounding each of the, the bright spots. And at first, one might be tempted to guess that these rings somehow correspond to perhaps gas surrounding the star. But if you've ever taken an intro to optics class, uh, you would realize that uh, this is something that's intrinsic to the optical system itself, to the telescope uh, and to the wave of wavelength of light that's being emitted by the star. In fact, you can see it even uh, in this artificial setting. So here, this is just some artificial point source of light um, imaged by a 2000 millimeter camera lens. Um, and you get the following image that you can find on Wikipedia. Okay. And in all of these cases, you see this ring pattern, uh, which, as we'll now see, emerges uh, very naturally from uh, the diffraction of light. Okay, so where does this diffraction pattern come from? Let's imagine a scenario where we have some point source of light, say some faraway star, and the light passes through some circular aperture, say the aperture of your telescope, onto an image plane. And this image plane is just the 2D plane on which the, you know, the final picture of your star uh, sits. And uh, specifically, we'll be interested in the limiting case where the distance between the point source and the aperture and the, dis the distance between the aperture and the image plane uh, are infinitely far. Uh, and one can achieve this in practical situ situations by putting uh, the appropriate lenses uh, in between. Okay, so that, that's what these uh, blue uh, circles will denote. And the outcome of uh, putting these lenses is that now we can imagine that the light waves being propagated from the point source are essentially parallel uh, when they hit the circular aperture. And as we saw, this results in some ring-like pattern uh, on, the, on the image plane. Okay, so where does this pattern come from? Well, let's try calculating the intensity at some given point on the image plane, call it capital P. By the, uh, by the standard huygens fresnel kirchhoff theory, um, essentially how, what, how this uh, ring pattern emerges is that uh, once the parallel light waves uh, are incident on the circular aperture, at every point inside the circle, uh, we're going to get some wavefront that propagates spherically out from that point. All right, so let's take some point uh, denoted by this vector u inside the circle, and let's try to analyze what its contribution uh, to the intensity at P is. Now naturally, because there are wavefronts propagating technically from every point in the aperture, there's going to be a ton of cancellations or interference. And so we, we can imagine trying to calculate uh, you know, the interference that comes between the wavefront uh, that propagates out of point U and the one that comes out of the center of the aperture. So let's denote the vector coming out of the center of the aperture as V. Uh, let's say V is a unit vector. Um, and the consequence of uh, this interaction between these two wavefronts should be some difference in phase. Okay. Um, and roughly speaking, this phase delay is precisely the projection of the vector u onto this vector v. Um, so I've denoted this by the purple vector, which has length u and a product v, 
And the resulting uh, effect on the amplitude of the electric field at point P in the image plane uh, as a result of this interaction is precisely a complex exponential that depends certainly on the wavelength of light, but also on the length of this purple vector, u inner product B. So to calculate the intensity of the point P at the point P on the image plane, all we need to do is integrate over all points u in the circle of this complex exponential, which depends on lambda, the wavelength, and u inner product B. And at the end of the day, we get some ring-like pattern here. And in fact, the intensity for this was worked out a long time ago. Uh, so let me denote the intensity uh, at a point in which has polar coordinates r comma theta um, as follows. So it's, it turns out it's proportional to the following function. It's the square of the ratio between uh, Bessel function of the first kind of order 1 uh, divided by r with the scaling parameter sigma. sigma um, so I'll refer to this as the spread parameter. You can think of it kind of like the sigma in you know, uh, the standard deviation of a, of a Gaussian. Um, and the spread parameter is proportional to the wavelength, which won't be too important to this talk. Um, but more importantly, it's inversely proportional to the radius of the aperture. Okay, so let's unpack that. So as sigma increases, this, uh, this what I'll call a point spread function, this ring pattern, um, gets wider and wider. So in particular, if the radius of the aperture gets bigger and bigger, sigma is going to get smaller, uh, and the image becomes more and more focused. So the wider your aperture, the more focused your image is. And this kind of makes sense. Um, so uh, based on what I alluded to in the previous slide, uh, basically this, this density comes from a Fourier transform, a 2D Fourier transform, uh, specifically of the ball of radius uh, 2 pi sigma uh, inverse. Okay, um, and so in some sense, the, the size of the ball uh, scales with the size of the aperture. Um, and specifically, this, uh, the square you can think of as essentially arising from the fact that we're getting, um, we're sort of losing some of the phase information and just getting an intensity measurement. Okay, so that's the interpretation. And uh, anyways, uh, for some historical background, this was actually calculated as far back as the you know, mid 19th century by uh, Sir George Bedell Airy, um, and that's why this pattern now uh, often is called an Airy disk, and that's what I'll refer to this uh, uh, this distribution as uh, going forward. Okay, so that's Fraunhofer diffraction, um, and so now let's uh, move on to this notion of diffraction limit that's so central to our talk. Um, so let me begin with sort of a nugget of conventional wisdom from optics. This is that the phenomena of diffraction that I just described should impose fundamental limits on the resolution of an optical system. All right, how do you see this? Well, let's imagine I have a pair of airy disks, uh, a pair of point sources, uh, which once I image, generate this pair of airy disks. And you can see that as I move these point sources closer and closer together, um, at some point, uh, the, the blurring that you get from the airy point spread function uh, makes it very difficult to discern which point source comes from, uh, which points on the image plane come from which point source. Okay, so a basic question that one can ask, and that was originally studied uh, by Airy and uh, leading physicists uh, at the time, was how close the two Airy disks have to be before it becomes impossible to distinguish them. Okay. Arguably the most famous uh, criterion for deciding, for answering this question is the so-called Rayleigh -like criterion. Um, and it's defined as follows. So let's say I have two area disks. Um, as soon as the center of one of the area disks intersects the first ring of the other, then according to the Rayleigh criterion, um, it is said that these two area disks are too close to, to resolve, too close to pick out uh, which points in my image come from one disk and which come from the other. All right, so in pictures, here I've just plotted the radial densities of two area disks. Um, and the point is that they're separated in such a way that uh, the first zero um, of the density function of one uh, coincides with the center of the, of the other. And if you work it out, you'll see that this is some multiple of uh, sigma, recall, uh, which is the spread parameter. And it makes sense that it scales with sigma because as the spread becomes bigger and bigger, so as these uh, images essentially become blurrier and blurrier, you expect that uh, 
you need uh, bigger and bigger separation in order to actually tell them apart. Okay, okay uh, it turns out there are many other uh, diffraction limits that have been proposed in literature. Um, the other very famous one is the so-called Abe limit. Um, uh, and how is this defined? Essentially, uh, the point is that um, this dictates that two area disks are uh, impossible to resolve as soon as their distance uh, goes below um, the support of the Fourier transform. Okay, uh, so what do I mean by that? Uh, okay, let's, we have our density function here. Uh, recall uh, from a pre previous slide I said that uh, this function inside the parentheses uh, is proportional to the indicator function of the ball. Um, and so immediately that, that tells us that the Fourier transform of the square of this function, so of this uh, density of the area disk, uh, is proportional to the ball convolved with itself. And this is a function that's very easy to like, explicitly compute. Okay, so what is, the, what is the convolution of the indicator of a ball with itself? Uh, it's essentially computing the area of the intersection of two balls of the appropriate radius. So recall the radius in question was 2 pi sigma inverse. Um, and uh, the value of the convolution at, uh, let's say, uh, delta is just going to be the, in the, radi uh, sorry, the area of the intersection between uh, two copies of this ball uh, at distance delta apart. So the, the area of this purple region. And this is just some function. And now uh, one can ask, like, at what point does this function go to zero? Well, obviously, that's the point at which these two disks are actually disjoint. And for them to be just disjoint, they have to be uh, two times radius uh, distance apart. Right? Um, and so that's precisely the radius of the support of the Fourier transform. Um, and the Abe limit dictates that as soon as the separation is less than one over the radius of this, the radius being um, uh, uh, pi sigma inverse, um, then then we conclude that uh, uh, that the separation is too small to distinguish the two area disks. Okay. So put another way, um, whereas the Rayleigh criterion dictated that the critical separation was 1.22 pi sigma, the Abe limit uh, dictates that it's exactly pi sigma. Okay. And let me just mention one more uh, diffraction limit. Uh, this was a proposed. Uh, a few decades afterwards um, by uh, Carol Mason Sparrow, um, who posited that actually the correct notion of diffraction limit should come slightly below the Abe limit. Um, namely when, if you took the corresponding density of this mixture of two area disks, um, so this convex combination of these two densities, uh, as soon as that density becomes unimodal is the point at which it truly becomes impossible to distinguish. Okay, and, uh, and it turns out this, this happens at uh, 0.94 pi sigma separation. Okay, so let's just uh, summarize what we know. All right, so on this line, I'm gonna plot uh, numbers that correspond to these factors. So we saw these factors of 0.94, 1, and 1.22. These are sort of the uh, critical distances below which uh, these uh, these physicists posited that um, resolution is impossible due to limits imposed by diffraction. So these are their diffraction limits. And it turns out that a host of other diffraction limits have been, have been proposed uh, subsequently in the literature. So soon after Abe and Rayleigh, uh, um, Dawes proposed something pretty close to Abe based on just heuristic observations. Uh, Schuster uh, essentially posited that twice the Rayleigh criterion was the right answer. And we had subsequent uh, criteria like Buxton's and Houston's. Okay, but this begs the, the obvious question, which notion of diffraction limit is actually the one that's you know, math, uh, mathematically meaningful? Is there a right notion of diffraction limit at all? Um, and this, this particular question, while natural, uh, has had a very long uh, sort of historical debate ever since um, you know, the calculation of the airy disk by, by airy and uh, the proposal of the Rayleigh criterion. Okay, so let's, let's look at some of that debate. All right, so this quote is by Schuster. So recall he proposed this uh, two times Rayleigh criterion um, threshold. So he said, there is something arbitrary in the Rayleigh criterion as the dip in intensity necessary to indicate resolution is a physio physiological phenomenon. Okay, um, and uh, 
as one can see if one comes through this literature, this uh, pointing out that uh, it, it's um, sort of a recurring theme to point out that the Riley criterion is uh, somehow arbitrary. On the other hand, if you look at uh, Sparrow's original paper where, where they uh, proposed the Sparrow criterion, um, there are some fairly strong opinions. They say, it is obvious that the point at which the density becomes unimodal, namely the Sparrow criterion, should set an upper limit to the resolving power. Okay, so uh, now let's look at uh, another take by Richard Feynman a couple decades later in his famous lectures. He says, it seems a little pedantic to put such precision into the resolving power formula. This is because Riley's criterion is a rough idea in the first place. It tells you where it begins to get very hard to tell whether the image was made by one or two stars. Actually, if sufficiently careful measurements of the exact intensity distribution over the diffracted image spot can be made, the fact that two sources make the spot can be proven even below the Abe limit. Okay. Right, so uh, at this point it becomes clear that, uh, you know, uh, there is uh, uh, the issue of like what the exact constant, if any, um, dictating the limits of evolution is, has been a, a fairly controversial uh, sticking point in the literature. Um, in fact, uh, leading optics researcher Trualdo de Francia put it even more bluntly. He said, it is only too obvious that from the mathematical standpoint, the image of two points, however close to one another, is different from that of one point. There is only a practical limit, if any, and not a theoretical limit for two-point resolving power. Right? So at this point, uh, it becomes clear that uh, you know, people start realizing that if you actually had literally the exact uh, intensity distributions, for your uh, particular mixture of area disks, then uh, you should, in principle, like information theoretically, you should be able to just distinguish uh, uh, whether you know you come from uh, two point sources or a one point source, and so uh, one begins to question like whether uh, any of these diffraction limits uh, impose any fundamental limit, um, and. You know, this, vi this viewpoint that uh, you know, if you actually have the perfect signal and zero noise in your measurement of the intensities that you could do perfectly well uh, was distilled by Joseph Goodman um, you know, uh, fairly recently uh, in a paper where he said, in fact, the ability to resolve two-point sources depends fundamentally on the signal-to-noise ratio. Criteria that do not take account of noise are subjective. Okay. Uh, but I would argue that okay, it's good to have some notion of uh, you know the signal to noise ratio as dictating uh, the limits of resolution, but I would argue that despite over a century of study in the optics community, um, our true understanding of what uh, limits diffraction imposes on resolution has never risen that far above these sorts of heuristic arguments. Right? And the goal of this work is really to kind of fill in that gap and provide um, some semblance of uh, statistical foundations uh, for th for these sorts of problems and um, begin to tackle sort of uh, what sorts of provable algorithmic guarantees can you, um, can you give in, in, in this sort of setting. Okay, so that's the uh, jumping point for uh, the results of this work, uh, which I'll describe now. And at a high level, the um, sort of the main takeaway message from this, this work is that uh, you can fruit, fruitfully think of resolution um, as uh, simply a problem about parameter learning uh, a particular mixture model. All right. And the mixture model arises very naturally from the physics of diffraction that I alluded to in the previous slides. Um, so let me just describe it now. Okay, so as before we have the, a spread parameter which is known a priori. Uh, it only depends on sort of known parameters of, of, uh, of your data set, namely the wavelength of light and um, specific uh, specific physical properties of the, the imaging system that you have. So let's just assume for now that it's some fixed constant. Um, and this won't be important because our algorithms are scale invariant. Scale invariant. Okay, um, now imagine I have k airy disks, each of which has some relative intensity. I'll call it lambda i for the ith disk. And let's say these sum to one. Um, and let's say my airy disks are centered at some uh, 2D points mu1 through mu k. And now I'd like to think of the superposition of k area disks as sort of a, as a probability distribution. Um, so you can imagine to sample a photon, what happens is I'm going to draw an index i uh, according to the relative intensity of that area disk, lambda i, 
And then I'm going to output a sample from that area disk, uh, which will have density, which is uh, essentially just a translated version of uh, the area point spread function that I defined on the previous slides. Okay. Uh, and let me uh, also just give some notation. Um, so we need some notion of separation uh, among disks in a superposition. Uh, so let me define capital delta to be the minimum pairwise distance uh, between any two points in the mixture. Okay, um, and so now I can formally think of this problem of resolution as, as just the following. I draw samples from this unknown distribution, which is given by a superposition of K area disks, and I want to draw enough samples uh, that I can efficiently recover uh, the parameters of the underlying area disks. So I want to recover uh, the centers and the relative intensities. Okay? That's what I mean by parameter learning a mixture model. Okay, so what can we say in, uh, from this viewpoint? So our first result is as follows. We show for any constant number of area disks and any pairwise se separation delta, no matter how small relative to the so-called uh, prescribed diffraction limits, you can recover the parameters of the superposition um, in time which uh, in time and sample complexity which scales uh, polynomially in everything. Okay. And there's an asterisk here because uh, you know at first glance this sounds too good to be true, but uh, the catch is that we have uh, fairly bad dependence on k. So in particular, we require uh, exponential and k squared dependence, where k is the number of area disks. Um, and so one can ask like uh, uh, the following two questions. One is, well, given that you have an algorithm that works at any separation, or at least it seems like the guarantee doesn't really care about the separation, uh, is there any sort of mathematical significance to diffraction limits like the Abe limit or the Riley criterion to begin with? Um, and the second related question is, is this exponential and k-square dependence necessary? Okay, and so our, uh, um, so our second result actually shows that uh, uh, if you actually go, go below um, one of the pre prescribed uh, diffraction limits, namely the Abe limit, uh, then you can actually come up with pairs of uh, mixtures of area disks for which you need exponentially many samples to distinguish uh, whether your samples come from one or the other. Okay, and so this uh, essentially resolves this mystery of, uh, you know, in light of theorem one, uh, what do diffraction limits mean anyways? And the point is that the limitations from diffraction, according to theorem two, only kick in when the number of centers is large. Okay, so if I go back to theorem one, theorem one essentially says that uh, for any small number of point sources, so imagine I'm trying to image a double star in the sky, um, this is already heuristically observed that you can actually uh, often go below the proposed uh, diffraction limits. And this was exactly what was hinted at by the quote by you know, Teraldo di Francia and uh, Joseph Goodman, when you're only worried about two point source resolution, uh, obviously the image produced uh, from samples by a mixture of two area disks is going to look very different from uh, the same image produced by a single area disk. Um, and uh, regardless of how far below the uh, diffraction limit you are. Um, and this sort of theorem one, theorem two together say that you can both uh, go below the diffraction limit uh, and yet, there is some statistical meaning assigned to, uh, you know, for instance, the Abe limit. Namely, if you go too far below the diffraction limit, then you're going to incur exponential sample complexity bounds. Okay, and finally, um, one can ask, well, there is still an exponential and k dependence uh, in theorem one. Can we lift this if we go below, uh, sorry, can we lift this if we go above uh, the Abe limit, for instance? Um, and so that's the content of our theorem three. Namely, if you go uh, a sufficiently large constant factor above the Abe limit, specifically this factor of 1.530, then actually you can achieve polynomial time and sample complexity, not just in one of epsilon, but in the number of area disks. Okay. So theorem two and theorem three taken together uh, pinpoint the following. Up to a constant factor, this suggests that the diffraction limit is simply uh, a, very a very sharp phase transition in sample complexity. Okay, and uh, you can actually see this from this plot, which uh, I'll explain shortly. So uh, in this plot, um, 
experimentally, what we did was we considered a particular pair of mixtures of airy disks, um, where we allowed both the number of uh, airy disks in each mixture uh, to vary, uh, and we also allowed the separation within either mixture to vary. Okay, so on the on the x-axis, what we plot is the separation within either mixture among the points in that mixture. Um, and you'll see the, the legend on the bottom right corresponds to the total number of uh, uh, area disks across both mixtures. Um, and so on the x-axis, what we plotted is on a log scale, the range of separations that we, uh, that we chose. Um, and in red, we've denoted the Abe limit uh, on this log scale. Um, and what we did was we plotted uh, the statistical distance between these mixtures, this, this uh, pair of mixtures, as you shrunk uh, the separation uh, within uh, either mixture, um, and as you varied the total number of uh, disks that were present in either mixture. Okay? So as you go from right to left, what you expect is, of course, as the you know, mixtures get tighter and tighter, as the separation goes down, you expect the statistical distance to go down as well. Um, and in light of our theorem two, what you would imagine is that as the number of airy disks uh, gets really large, so let's say, um, let's look at this bottom most uh, curve in yellow, you would expect that at the Abe limit, there should be sort of a sharp change from statistical distance that sort of decays uh, polynomially to statistical distance that decays uh, exponentially. And this transition you can see precisely at the Abe limit. Um, and I should emphasize that, uh, so in this case, for this particular instance, you can actually get uh, polynomial time uh, and polynomial sample complexity guarantees. Uh, but uh, for general instances, we're only able to show this uh, modulo, this extra factor of 1.53. Okay. But in any case, the takeaway should be that you should think of this diffraction limit as a phase transition in sample complexity um, that depends precisely on k. Um, namely, you transition from poly in k above the diffraction limit to exponential in k uh, below. Okay, so in the remaining time, I'm just going to say a bit about the sort of techniques that go into our results. Um, uh, a key ingredient is this connection to the sparse Fourier transform, uh, specifically sparse Fourier transform off the grid. So let me describe the setup now. Okay, so uh, as before, we still have relative intensities and centers. You can think of these as exactly the same things that, uh, that appear in the mixture of area disks setup. Um, and at a high level, what this problem entails is I'm given some spike train, so some linear combination of just point masses at these points mu1 through mu k in two dimensions. And I would like to recover these parameters, uh, namely the intensities and the centers, uh, by making Fourier measurements on this spike train. But the catch is that I'm not allowed to make Fourier measurements at frequencies that are too fine-grained. So there's going to be some cutoff frequency beyond which I'm not allowed to make any measurements. Um, as we'll see, this arises naturally in the setting of uh, learning from uh, mixtures of area disks. Uh, but in general, you should think of this cutoff frequency as saying, in general, uh, in, in practice, like, uh, uh, maybe I can only measure up to uh, sort of very coarse grain features, but I'd still like to recover uh, sort of the signal in my data. OK, um, and so what we uh, what we get access to is for any frequency omega in 2D uh, with norm at most the cutoff frequency, I get a noisy estimate of the following, namely the Fourier transform uh, of the spike train evaluated at frequency omega. Okay? Um, and my goal is just from such queries, I want to recover the relative intensities and the centers. Okay, so on, on the one hand, uh, we have this question in sparse recovery. And on the other, we have this mixture model question, which is learning the parameters of a mixture of airy disks. What is the connection? Um, also, let me, let me just mention that this, this particular problem of uh, sparse continuous Fourier transform you know, has a long line of study dating back to the work of Donahoe and Stark. Um, so here are some, some of the important references. <laughs> 
So let me quickly summarize the reduction. I'll, I'll leave this top right box of, of the relevant uh, variable names. Okay, so say I have some mixture of area disks uh, with centers mu sub i, and let me just call i sub uh, little i the intensity of the area disk which is centered at mu i. And so the reduction works as follows. Um, to learn this mixture of area disks using sparse Fourier transform, for any frequency, I can try computing the following empirical estimate. Uh, namely, the for, uh, an, an empirical estimate of the Fourier transform of my image. So this expectation is over the mixture of area disks. Okay, evaluate at frequency omega. Right, so I empirically estimate the Fourier transform, and by linearity, I can express this as just a convex combination of the Fourier transforms of the components. Now, component, each component is just a, a shifted version of the airy point spread function which I'll denote by capital I. And the Fourier transform of shifting just incurs some extra phase factor, which is this, X, this complex exponential. Right, so this is the Fourier transform of my image at frequency omega. And you can see it's basically just the Fourier transform of the spike train times some extra I hat omega term. And the point is that I know this I hat omega term. So if I had a good estimate for the Fourier transform of my image, uh, namely this beta tilde omega, then I can get an uh, I can get access to the uh, Fourier transform of the spike train, which is the uh, object of interest in sparse Fourier transform, by just pointwise dividing by i hat, I hat omega. Okay, uh, and where does the cutoff frequency come in? Uh, recall that i hat omega is only supported over uh, a certain band of frequencies. Uh, at some point, it, it dips down to zero, um, and it becomes impossible to pointwise divide by I, I hat omega. Okay, and, and that's, that's the reduction. So we know I hat, I hat omega explicitly. It's supported on a ball of radius uh, pi sigma inverse. And so we can query uh, noisily the Fourier transform of the spike train, namely the sum of lambda i's of complex exponentials um, using this procedure and thereby reduce to the uh, band limited sparse Fourier transform setting. Okay, that's the reduction. Um, let me just briefly mention uh, the techniques that go into sparse Fourier transform. So I'll specialize to the 1D case, uh, for which a variety of algorithms are known. So in the 1D case, um, right, the parameters are shown here. And uh, algorithms like Prony's method, uh, music, LN minimization, matrix pencil method all work without noise. So if I had perfect access to the Fourier transform of the spike train, um, and we'll focus on the matrix pencil method because it actually has uh, provable robustness properties for a, a very wide range of parameters. Okay, so um, let me just briefly in like one slide explain the matrix pencil method. The idea is that I compute uh, the Fourier transform of my spike train uh, over a grid of frequencies all the way up to the cutoff frequency. So L, uh, beta L is going to be the Lth uh, sort of evaluation on this grid of the Fourier transform. And I'm going to form these two matrices, which are Henkel matrices assembled out of these Fourier measurements. Now, if these betas were literally the Fourier transform evalu uh, of the spike train evaluated at these uh, points, then I'd be in great shape. Uh, the point is that the generalized eigenvalues of the pair A comma B are exactly complex exponentials uh, given by the centers of my spike train. Okay, uh, but of course we don't have exact access to the Fourier transform. Uh, but the nice uh, fact that was shown in work of uh, Moitra in 2015 was that actually the matrix pencil method is robust to noise as long as a particular Vandermann matrix, um, namely the one generated by the complex exponentials, is well conditioned. Uh, and so a key ingredient in our result is that um, for any separation, regardless of its relation to these diffraction limits, uh, if my um, centers are delta separated, then the condition number of this matrix scales at most exponentially in k squared. Okay. So now let me just conclude by sketching very briefly how our um, full algorithm for uh, theorem one works. So recall theorem one says that for any constant number of area disks, uh, we can learn in time, uh, which is polynomial in all parameters except k. Here's the, al here's the algorithm. The point is I want to reduce to the 1D problem for which I know matrix pencil works. Uh, 
Um, and so let me project in a random direction and just reduce this to a 1D sparse Fourier transform instance where the centers are uh, the projections of my 2D centers onto V1. Okay? And why do I pick a random direction? I want to ensure that uh, there is some level of separation between my centers after I project. And with constant probability, uh, a random direction will, will uh, ensure this. Okay, the idea is now I can use matrix pencil method to recover the projected centers. And then I can just repeat this process for another randomly chosen direction. I have a pair of 1D estimates that I can now pair up to get into a 2D estimate by solving an appropriate linear system. And that's basically it. So the key technical ingredient is that condition number bound that I showed and uh, mentioned on the previous slide. Um, there are a couple like uh, fairly straightforward subtleties, but um, one is that if I want to do this pairing up procedure, unfortunately, these 1D subproblems only allow me to recover the projected centers up to some unknown permutation. Um, and so how do I actually match up you know, one set of uh, 1D estimates, uh, K 1D estimates, with another set of K 1D estimates? Um, the idea is that if I pick V1 completely randomly, but I pick V2 to actually just be a small deterministic rotation of V1, then the sorted lists of projected centers will actually match up. Um, and in this case, uh, it's well specified like uh, what linear system I should be solving in order to get the consolidated 2D estimate. The other issue is that this procedure, uh, recall, has some constant probability failure if my random direction is no good. And the question is, how do I boost? Um, and uh, basically, you know, as one would expect, you run the procedure logarithmically many times, um, and then it turns out you can do some clustering in order to, um, to recover the estimates uh, with uh, lower probability of failure. Okay, so that's, that's essentially the full algorithm. Um, I encourage you to check the, the paper for details regarding our proofs of theorems two and three. Uh, but for now, let me just uh, conclude with some open questions. So the most obvious one is uh, to pinpoint the right constant. Right? So this is, in some sense, a research program that's dated back all the way to uh, uh, Lord Riley, but uh, at this point we know rigorously um, that it, it is some number between 1 and 1.530, and now the question is just to, to find the right constant. And so uh, going into the project, I imagine that you know, the most obvious guess for the, the right constant should be the Abe limit. Given this reduction to sparse Fourier transform, um, you would expect that as soon as the Fourier transform is not giving you any information, uh, namely the point at which it vanishes, um, should correspond uh, to the ultimate like uh, limitations of this problem. Uh, but surprisingly, recently in follow-up work, what we show is that using a more sophisticated construction um, than the one in uh, the paper uh, that this talk is about, um, we show that you, you can actually show a stronger lower bound, namely slightly above the Abe limit um, at a factor of 1.155, um, you actually also still need exponential sample complexity. So this is very surprising, and it, it says that, well, uh, at least Abe was incorrect, um, but it still leaves open what the right constant is. Uh, another technical question that might be interesting is uh, getting sample complexity near linear in K. Um, so indeed, this kind of uh, near linear in K dependence is the selling point of the entire the sparse Fourier transform literature, um, but the drawback is that that literature typically achieves this at some extra log factor cost to the cutoff frequency. Um, and in, in our setting, we're really interested in the exact like, constant factors. Um, and so it would be very cool to get some kind of guarantee uh, that achieves a tight constant factor and is um, optimal in terms of sample complexity. Um, and so more broadly, I would argue that um, uh, perhaps a more interesting research program would be to understand uh, the following. Um, whether this perspective of unsupervised learning can actually shed light on related problems in optics. Um, so there's been a, actually a, a, a fair amount of activity recently, um, given the emergence of the so-called super resolution micro microscopy techniques, um, to understand um, sort of uh, the exact like uh, performance of these technologies that claim to be you know, beating the diffraction limit in some fundamental way. Um, but in the absence of any sort of statistical foundations for understanding diffraction limits prior to this work, 
it stands, uh, it, it's, it's a fairly um, daunting challenge to actually understand uh, rigorously like what sorts of uh, limits are being broken by these exciting technologies. Um, so let me just conclude with a quote from a recent paper by Demerle et al. Um, that focused on assessing these kinds of claims. Um, and they say, the recent introduction of a range of commercial super resolution instruments means that resolution has once again become a battleground between different microscope technologies and rival companies. So in that sense, um, I hope that uh, this work serves as a, a stepping stone to future work that can uh, provide more rigorous uh, statistical foundations for understanding these sorts of claims. Um, and I believe that this is a question that is both of great scientific interest and, in this case, practical interest. Um, and so on that note, I'd like to end this talk. Um, and given that this is a recorded talk, uh, please uh, uh, respond with comments uh, in the video, and I'm happy to answer them offline. Great. Thank you.